Now it is my pleasure to introduce Professor Satiris Vanilaitis uh, from ANU, where he is Professor of Global Environmental Health at the ANU National Centre for Epidemiology and Population Health. Until last year, Satiris was at the Institute of Occupational Medicine in Edinburgh, where he was the Director of Research and Head of the WHO Collaborating Centre on Occupational Health. He's done a huge amount of work for the European Parliament and the UK uh, in these issues. I very much look forward to hearing from Sir Thierry. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maureen. Thank you for having me here today. And uh, I hope it's my turn now, mostly. Uh, and uh, and uh, coming after Mark and Catherine, that gives me very good training for the talk and the points I want to make today. Uh, and, very good to see so some of you turning up today. I know the challenges uh, uh, about coronavirus and, and travel and being exposed to public spaces. So it's, uh, it's good to see brave faces here uh, participating in this event. So uh, I'm, I'm going to focus on the health effect, the impacts of climate change and uh, some of the solutions related to that, to those, to those impacts. Uh, the main focus will be around. Uh, Direct effects like heat exposure and also air pollution in relation to uh, all sorts of pollution, but most particularly uh, in relation to bushfires in, in Australia and our recent experience. Some of the examples, uh, I'm going to be giving some of the examples from, from global examples, some from Australia, some from the UK, uh, where I was based in recently. So, this, this graph here, I'll give you a pointer illustrates the impacts of climate change on human health. I'm not sure if we are able to, to read this line, but some of these impacts are direct impacts, like extreme heat or severe weather. Some other are more indirect impacts, like changing patterns of uh, air pollution or changing, uh, changing vector ecology. Also increases allergies in the atmosphere, like pollen. Impacts on water quality, water and food supply systems, and also environmental degradation. So the, the impacts of climate change uh, can be very complex. Climate change is not like a new pandemic, it's not a new virus, but it's a bit more of a risk for multiplier. So it increases, it amplifies risks that we are more or less familiar with, like a, a heat, like bushfires, droughts, floods, etc. And, and what you can see also on these slides are the knock-on effects on, on human health. From uh, respiratory allergens uh, uh, and uh, respiratory health impacts, uh, uh, also that uh, more diseases, communicable diseases, but also malnutrition, post migration, conflict, mental health impacts, and, and, and the heat related and more direct impacts related to injuries and fatalities. So it's a, it's a very complex picture. Uh, I will move on to focus on, on heat related mortality, and that was picked up by, by, by Mark in the first presentation today. Uh, I will show you some uh, maps of surface temperature in Australia. These maps are produced by CSIR, and, and how these temperature maps evolve over time during the century. So, this is the model uh, temperatures for 2020, this 2050, and this 2080. And, and what you can see is that the, the hot regions are expanding uh, and cover most of the continent, the larger part of the continent. And this, of course, has an effect on, on heat related mortality. We carried out uh, some estimates. So we, we calculated the mortality associated with heat in Australia and in other countries, but I'll show you the results from Australia uh, over the century. And what you can see here are the Estimates, uh, the baseline results 2020, 2015, 2018, and you can see an increase in heat and late mortality, quite a steep increase. If we add to that population projection, we see that the increase is much steeper, so from uh, uh, around 500 deaths to around 1500 deaths by the, towards the end of the century. And, and, and of course, you know, this is something very significant, this uh, sharp increase in heat and late mortality. Of course, at the same time, uh, climate change uh, has, uh, has as a result milder winters, uh, so we have a reduction uh, potentially in cold related mortality. And you can see here the estimates of reduction. Uh, 
But when we add the population projection to these uh, effects, we see that the effects, this reduced uh, impact of, of cold on, on, on population health and mortality is much less than the increase in, in heat related mortality. So, overall, based on this modeling work, we see an increase in temperature related mortality in, in Australia over the century. Quite an, increase, quite an important increase. Another aspect of heat related uh, 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 effects is the, is the pressure they put on, on the health services and the ambulance services in particular. We, we did some analysis in London in that case, and, and what you can see here on this graph is the increase in the uh, uh, call outs, ambulance call outs, when the temperature drops below zero degrees or when it is uh, much higher, over 25 degrees or so. so what you can see from this graph is that you have an increase in, in uh, ambulance call-outs when uh, temperatures are either very high or very low, and that puts pressure on, on the health, service, or health services. And, and this is a similar kind of uh, uh, outcome when you analyze the, uh, the response time of the ambulance uh, call-outs. So what you can see here is that the response time uh, actually increases when the temperatures are very high or very low and this is because of the uh, volume of, of collapse but also because of the weather conditions in the spring. So that's something important to bear in mind. And of course ambulance service is not the only part of the health service uh, which is affected by extreme temperatures. I'm going to show you some um, mapping we did of temperature in the UK uh, during two very prominent uh, heat wave events. So we have the very prominent heat wave of 2003 and then 2006. So this 2000, 2003 heat wave uh, in Western Europe uh, caused around 70,000 deaths across, across many countries. Many people are very, uh, those with pre existing health conditions, but obviously it was a massive impact on, on uh, population health, massive impact on mortality levels. And that created many uh, heat health uh, adaptation uh, uh, plans and uh, heat wave plans in, in many countries. So what, what you can see in these maps is that this heat effect is, is uh, different in different parts of the city. So this is this is a, a typical city in the UK, it's very dumb in the Midlands. And you can see that the heat in the middle of the city, the most densely populated areas, is much higher compared to the surrounding. Uh, uh, suburban and rural areas, and, and this is because of what we call the urban heat island effect. So heat has a higher impact in the center, in the city center, uh, that will apply to Melbourne City and other big cities, where the, uh, there are uh, less green spaces, less uh, blue spaces, and uh, uh, the areas are much more built up and there are more emissions of uh, anthropogenic heat. So this is something to bear in mind when we look at the vulnerability of the population to uh, the effects of climate change and heat in particular. Now, of course, urban areas sometimes look like this, particularly in, in developing countries. And uh, as Catherine pointed out, uh, the impact of climate change are, are likely to be much higher in uh, lower and middle income countries compared to high income countries, and also most particularly uh, on uh, populations on, on, uh, on the lower socioeconomic strata of, of our urban communities. Uh, like the people living in informal settlements. And this is because of the, obviously of, of the housing conditions, the density, and the lack of, uh, of primary, uh, primary uh, care, uh, healthcare services. Other population groups which are likely to feel the, the heat, uh, literally, are people working outdoors. And, and we have uh, identified population groups which are, and working groups, workers groups, which are more vulnerable to, to heat, like uh, in agriculture and in, in, in the construction industry. And there is a very substantial loss of uh, productivity associated with uh, increased temperatures and green temperatures in these sectors and the climate change scenarios. I will move on quickly to discuss some of the impacts of air pollution, which is uh, something related to climate change. So climate change affects the patterns of air pollution in, in different ways, depending on the pollutants. Here, um, what I want to show you is mortality associated with the uh, outdoor air pollution uh, around the world. This is related to uh, fine particles and, and ozone. And, and you can see that the levels of mortality associated with pollution are much higher in uh, East Asia, China, South Asia, uh, India in particular, 
in parts of Europe and, and North America as well, and also in Western, uh, Western Africa. This, this picture uh, is very significant, obviously, it shows the distribution of evolution but, uh, and the mortality levels. What we need to bear in mind is that the impact of evolution annually uh, across the world is around 70, 7 billion attributable deaths. So we're talking about the population of, uh, of a state or of a, of a country like uh, Bulgaria or Paraguay are being wiped out of the year because of exposure to uh, indoor and outdoor air pollution from, from all, sort, all sources, all sectors, anthropogenic and natural sources. So the impact of, of air pollution is, is a direct impact on mortality and it's a very high uh, priority for, for public health uh, globally. In, in Australia, we have uh, typically much better air quality than most parts of the world. But of course, this year has been a very different year, uh, and we'll experience the bush fires, which I'm going to refer to in a moment. But I would, I would like to show you first um, some more information about cities. So, most of the impacts of, of air pollution are associated with urban areas. And as uh, the World Health Organization has pointed out, 80% of the global population lives in cities where air quality is uh, uh, worse than the uh, guideline values, uh, which are recommended by, uh, by, by uh, public health physicians. You can see here on this map the distribution of the cities. So most of the worst polluted cities are in India, China, uh, South Asia. But you can also spot on this, on this graph Sydney and, and Melbourne here, where air quality is generally good. You, you can see here we're under the dotted line, which is the guideline, the World Health Organization guideline for particulate air pollution. But I would like to stress the point that even at these levels uh, of air pollution uh, in, in Australia, we still have uh, around 2% of all cause mortality attributed to uh, air pollution in, in, in Australia. So still the impact on, on population health is quite substantial. We're talking about around 2,800 deaths attributable to uh, fine particles uh, in Australia every year. So there's a strong uh, uh, strong reason here for the use in air pollution even below those levels of experience today. And of course this map doesn't include uh, this kind of situations that we experienced this year, the air pollution from bushfires, which have been very extreme in many parts of the country and has affected populations at, at very distances from the, from, from the fire front like in Sydney. So this picture goes back to the 30th of October, it sounds like a long time ago now, and you see air quality was very bad in Sydney for, for a long period of time, a number of weeks. Uh, it didn't get any better in December. Uh, you can see here how air pollution fluctuated over the month of December with the highest peaking on the 10th of December. And you can see again here the, the guideline value of, uh, of 10 microcentimeter cube for uh, fine particles. But what I would like to point out on this graph is that air pollution goes up and down. And there is a way for us to uh, modify our daily activities in a way that minimizes our exposure to fine particles. So there are ways we can uh, uh, reduce our exposure and protect our health. And, and also that depends on the spatial variability of air pollution. So you can see here air pollution levels in different parts of Sydney on the 10th of December. And you can see the levels here are very, very high. The limit value is 10 microns from the and you have here values of 500. But the concentration of, of PM4.5 in the south and closer to, to the coast were substantially lower. These are the concentrations in Canberra on the, on the 5th of January. As you can see here on my, on my portable uh, monitor, uh, the PM2 levels were off the scale. And you cannot see the pattern from that side of the way, but it's on a good day. And this is uh, the haze, the smoke haze in Melbourne on the 14th of, of January. So you had very serious problems, many cities affecting people. And you can see how people try to protect themselves with respirators. We can discuss the different ways of food. we can protect ourselves and, and reduce our exposure. And we also produce facts in relation and advice in relation to the mental health effects of, food, of bushfires and, and smoke exposure, which were very substantial. Other aspects of air pollution to be aware of is ozone pollution, which is uh, experienced further down the emission sources. Uh, 
And uh, we know that climate change has an impact on ozone, it has what we call the climate penalty on ozone, so it increases ozone concentration in big cities, as we have seen in Sydney, in the UK, and in other parts of the world. And uh, also, I would like to highlight that many of the policies uh, that will aim to mitigate uh, climate change, the policies that will reduce greenhouse gas emissions, will have also a beneficial effect on, on uh, air, pollution, air pollution emissions uh, at the local level. And you can see here on this graph, which are the win-win policies, the win-win interventions which improve uh, air quality and also mitigate climate change. And this includes energy efficiency, renewable energy, uh, zero emission vehicles, uh, carbon tax and storage, etc. Very important to promote these kind of policies that, that have win-win uh, benefits for health and, and well-being. And I've highlighted some of these policies here. Uh, ACT has made a good uh, progress in this area with the ACT climate change strategy published last year. And I think there's potential for similar uh, progress, uh, of course, across Australia and globally. And I will finish with a uh, couple of publications uh, uh, we uh, published recently in the Medical Journal of Australia uh, and other media calling for an expert committee on, on air pollution and uh, health protection, a similar committee. Uh, to the Committee of Climate Change that had a, a, a previous part of our calling for this committee to be established. So I think there's a lot of scope for this committee that will provide uh, national consistency in air pollution and, and health protection in Australia. Now we finish with this slide with the Sustainable Development Goals, goals seen through the lens of, of health. Thank you very much. Thank you.